So what this presentation is, is really kind of about embracing your awesomeness is kind of how my um, name is. And what my goal is just to help people get free from their fears, guilt, people pleasing. And ultimately, because I see that as a barrier for people who are in business, have businesses, businesses of their own, when they're led um, first by their fears or even people pleasing, that that can really impact. So we'll kind of dig into that a little bit more. Uh, but first, to introduce myself, um, my name is Anita Farley. So it looks like not Anita Farley, but um, the... <laughs> The Farley is actually Farley. I went to high school with my husband. I had no clue that it was actually different than how it sounds until I made reservations and they really hijacked my name, my last name. So um, I'm a nurse. I've been a nurse for over 25 years. I worked down at Mayo Clinic for 20 of those years. Um, and I most recently became an author so I started coming into wing space. I was kind of stalking Melanie because I wanted to be a part of this community um, because secretly while I was a nurse, I chose that because my dad said, if you don't pick a, a field, um, I'm going to stop paying for it. <laughs> and so <laughs> and this was in like your seventh year of college. Then, uh, yeah. Well, I had, yeah, I liked the, you know, after activities more than the actual school time. <laughs> so, um, I chose nursing. It was, I knew it was always going to have a, a, a job. Like that was just, um, I was smart enough to figure that part out. So, uh, but what I actually ended up doing was going back and getting my master's in business because I just always had this interest in the operational side of things and business and, and that side. So I've been a nurse for 25 years, but probably 20 plus of those years have been in leadership and management. And so that's my passion. That's my love. And really what I love about it is developing people and helping them see who they're not taking advantage of being because I work predominantly with women. And so I find that that's who I kind of gravitate, gravitate towards working with. But so often women just don't embrace who they are. And they actually, to a certain degree, downplay it. And so we'll go into that a little bit. So that's um, a little bit about me. And um, the book really is about creating confidence, boundaries, and peace of mind. And I bring Melanie into this because I don't think without this space, this um, wing space, that I would have finished my book. And it was really because she created this community here, and then I had the opportunity to come and start working here because nurses don't come and work in, there's not a reason for us to come work in a community like this. And so um, I always had the idea, I've been tinkering with it for some time, but then coming here was really able to just focus, get it done, and then get it launched and actually launched it. And day one, I hit number one in three different categories on Amazon. So oh, that was awesome. awesome. Yeah. yeah. So that kind of fueled my own, um, what was possible. And today you're going to learn how to fly. So not really, but the other part of me is I'm a mom. I've got two amazing gymnasts that I get to practice on every single day because what they do is very scary. And who they are in this little world of 11 and 14 year old um, girls and um, they're gymnasts. So they're doing something that takes a lot of courage, a lot of confidence. And so I really do get to practice on them every day because they get their fears get bigger than what they, you know, they don't even realize what they can do. That picture there on the right, how did she get that high? <laughs> right? She's on a bounce beam, four inches underneath her. Where's the beam? Uh, you can't really see it in the picture. It's kind of over That's here. Unbelievable. That's unbelievable. She's about five feet in the air. Wow. That yeah. Is insane. And that little girl suffers from insecurities. So it just starts, you know, when you're teeny tiny. And um, even despite what they can do, it's still... It's incredible. Yeah. Yep. Could it have started when she first got on the balance beam? Right. <laughs> so, you know, the truth is I am myself recovering as a chicken. Yeah, it was, it was, it's the truth. I, when I went into management leadership, I was uh, 22, 23. I was invited to go into a position of leadership. I didn't realize what I could do. I didn't believe in myself. 
but I was also petrified. So I was very much a pleaser and I was always, um, over delivering. Like, I mean, I'm, you know, the one who was, if anybody, I wanted to please everyone, wanted to please every nurse in the unit, wanted to please, um, my boss. And, you know, you always have that conceptual, you can't please everyone, but I was certainly going to try. And I really didn't think that, you know, pertained to me. So I, what I know now is what I'll talk a little bit about in the presentation is a little bit more about my brain. Um, but the idea was to uh, investigate the root cause of people pleasing. How does it happen? Was it the first time you stepped on a balance beam or was it something that happened earlier that had nothing to do with the balance beam? Um, also how our brains were designed. So being a nurse, I love clinical. I've always been really interested in our brain and how it functions. So, uh, but what I'm found that I'm drawn to is now more in the, um, I used to take care of subarachnoid hemorrhages and, um, gunshot wounds to the head. So that was my first, um, experience with neuro and my first love and passion. But now I get the, um, actual, how it's wired and how our network of a brain is um, much like the electricity in the room. And so we're going to go into that and then the impact really that this is happening on your business. And so, um, I do have a side business myself. It is in direct sales. And so I've had the opportunity to grow a team of amazing women, but again, they don't believe in themselves. And so it's been just shocking to me to have this, um, over and over, um, of seeing people who have such amazing potential, but they don't own it. So, and absolutely that affects their business because the business kind of flatlines a little bit when they're not, um, when they're stuck behind those fears. So, you know, what is, um, what is people pleasing really? And kind of how does it like, so when I think of people pleasing, I, I think of that eager, um, over zealous to help and to do, um, good. And does anybody have a different kind of, kind of an agreement that's. I think we're dog pleasers. I mean, we kind of do everything for our dog. So I think they've yes. kind of got us trained. I mean, <laughs> we are, we are. Yeah. I mean, I bet if you went and surveyed most people who have animals, that um, animals are more in charge than the adults are. <laughs> Yeah. I think um, there's a there's a downside to people pleasing, mm -hmm. and that's that uh, you may rely on feedback, and if you don't get it, you don't feel so good. Bingo. Oh God, yes. Bingo. And that's what that's what happens. So it doesn't, um, you know, just even it's it's like there's a continuum, yeah. and there's a degree of confidence, and there's a degree of of insecurity. And somewhere in there is that sweet spot of having that belief within yourself. But once you go over it, then you start to need the approval and other people's feedback to feel full yourself. So it's almost a counterintuitive thing because you're doing it selfishly yeah. because you need the accolades or you, because something's missing there. So, um, <coughs> And that's kind of goes into why we do it. Uh, that was supposed to be dogs begging, but, but so why do we do it is, is exactly that we're doing that because, um, there's something within, us, something that's been wired into our brains for whatever reason, an experience or something that then, um, we are seeking the approval of other people. And it's really about wanting to be liked and looking good and, and, and all of that. So, can you see, I don't, I didn't ask everyone what they do in business. I kind of know a little bit, but can you see how this could possibly impact what you're doing in business? Like with clients, sure. mm -hmm. yeah. any examples of, well, I, I have a, a question. I think of people pleasing, like you just said, continuum, like for some people, it's an innate part of a personality and can be a strength or a weakness, depending mm -hmm. on and for others, it's something that's either a learned or a, you know, something they have to put on and, and project to the world. Are you using it mostly in a, in a, like a, a neck, not, not a neck, it's something that's not always the most positive for you, Correct. the person who's doing it. Yeah. I'm looking at it from yeah. the perspective of how is it a detriment to your business? Got it. How is it a detriment to your leadership and management? Yeah. 
it's a detriment to your business because you should have certain standards about customer service mm -hmm. and provide a lot of it, but um, not let the customer take advantage of you because then your profit line will go down. Exactly. Right. I think I heard the other day the first one to speak loses. Mm -hmm. And and that would be in sales. So the longer you can put it out there and this is the price and really own who you are and what you're offering somebody. And it's not just right now, this one time, it's like their lifetime, what you're really giving them, their value. And the, and the sooner that you diminish that and try to engage and you get nervous, then they have the upper hand. Um, everybody is different. You know, I... There's no cookie cutter person that has their, their experiences, but, and we just talked about that. How is it affecting your business? So if you are somebody who has, um, uh, anxiety of calling, um, new clients, setting up, uh, you know, cold market, if you will, and that kind of freezes you, that fear is going to stop you and your insecurities are going to prevent you from, uh, being powerful and engaging with them and owning who you are. So that's going to affect your business. That's going to affect your bottom line, yeah. your profit. And, and we're not all, yeah, I was having this, this discuss discussion with my cousin the other day because I said, why are you in business? To me, you're in business because of the, the, the revenue part, you're in business to sustain revenue. And she's like, well, not always. I'm like, okay, Granted, you have usually a passion that you want to share or you have a, an amazing talent that you want to share. And I get that too, because truly for me, I'm not really driven by money. What I'm driven by is helping people. I mean, that's clearly why I did subconsciously go for nursing. But if I am small and into people pleasing, how, how much am I helping them? Yeah. Right. If if I am worried about what you're thinking about me, if I'm worried about um, you not buying my piece of art and taking it only for 50 percent, I'm worried about that because I'm not owning who I am and my value. How am I going to make a difference in your world? So I see it as as multiple ways in why we're in business and how it can impact us. Okay, so this is kind of a success equation that I saw once that I was like, oh my gosh, that's just really cool because it really, if you think about it and you study it and you ponder it, you can see how if all of the variables are not in alignment, how your end result and your success can be negatively impacted. So each one of these could be its own study, but if you lack vision, if you don't know what you're doing with your business, that's gonna lead to confusion. If you lack skills, that's gonna to lead to some anxiety on your end. If you lack tools and resources to get the, the work done, you're going to be frustrated. And if you don't have an execution plan, you're just gonna have a whole bunch of false starts. And then I believe if you lack confidence, and I kind of would say that that sometimes is almost 90% of the, the pie, is you're gonna be led to doubt and disbelief. So when all of those are in alignment and you've got the vision, you've got the skills, you've got the money, you've got the place, you have a plan and you believe in your value, then that's where you can come together and really create the success that you're, you know, that you're dreaming to do or visioning to do. So my particular interest, of course, is in that confidence because the lack of confidence is caused by your fears, your attachments, and then also a lack of boundaries and kind of self-control in that. And so um, I even think of lack of boundaries. People a lot of times think of lack of boundaries with each other, but I think it's a lack of boundaries within yourself. Like, I'm not gonna go there. I'm not gonna devalue myself. I'm not gonna take 50% off of that picture that I know is worth 100 times more. So it's just creating that value within yourself. So the brain has this mission, um, among other things. I mean, obviously it's also how we walk and talk and speak and all of that other, but in the subconscious and the consciousness kind of world, the brain has a mission of protecting you. So it is survival. And so once upon a time we were getting protected from mountain lions and, 
you know, um, caveman days, uh, the external threats. But, you know, most of our threats nowadays are truly inside of our own head. And we still respond the same way. <clears throat> so whether it's a bobcat in your backyard or a concern or worry in your head, you're physiologically impacted heart rate, respiratory rate, um, nervousness, anxiety. So the brain's mission is to protect you, but then the brain also has really positive intentions. So it's really protecting you for a good reason, but counterintuitively, sometimes what happens is from the process of it protecting us in a positive nature, the behaviors that we end up displaying are unwanted and desired. So I'll give you an example, and, and Melanie, I think I shared this with you the other day. I couldn't figure out why was I such a freaking pleaser? Like, why was I so eager to make everybody happy? And even at the expense of my own personal happiness, I didn't want to be like that dog, you know, that was eager and at the door. And, it, you know, you send me a text, I immediately respond back. And the phone rings, I pick it up on the first call. And what are they thinking? And is, that, is somebody mad at me and all that stuff? So... I go back to, I don't know what grade I was in. Uh, I think second or third grade, I lived a block away from whom was my girlfriend was my best friend. And I'm skipping down to her house. We used to play all the time together. I get there, knock on the door. She opens it. The new neighbor is next to her, Destiny. <laughs> she lives in between us across the street from the house. that has a dog that scared me all the time. But Katie says to me, we, you can't play with us. So I didn't realize the impact that had on me that day. Uh, and it was a memory. I can remember everything. I can remember how they stood. I can remember the doorway. I can remember everything. What I didn't realize at that moment is what it made, what I made the meaning to me, which was there was something wrong with me. So I could have gone any number of ways. Another person could have been like, screw you uh, gotten angry or whatnot. But what I did as that, that person, my brain wanted to protect me. And I thought something was wrong with me. And I made a decision at that very moment that was never going to put myself in the position again to be rejected. So counterintuitively at that point, I started always being who people wanted me to be. I started being a pleaser. I started being the one everybody liked. I started being the popular one. I started being everything to ever prevent me from feeling that hurt again. And that's where the counterintuitive thing is because the brain was really just protecting me and saying, back up, you know, like, um, well, it, it, what it really did was is it, it protected me from ever be being rejected again. But unfortunately, the way that I manifested that and became was actually a detriment in the long run. And I was the one suffering from that. So once I can recognize that, then that's when you can start doing something about it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so yeah, you can blame it on your brain. <laughs> We all want to blame it on somebody, right? Um, but truly, that is the, the possibility is there that you can, there is neurological explanations. And what happened at that moment when you get into neuro, the neuroplasticity or the wiring of the brain is there was a, a, a foundation that was laid for me on that day. And it probably didn't happen overnight, but that new possibility of if I'm good, if I'm pleasing, if I'm liked, then I'm not going to feel that hurt again. Um, made a little tiny like dot in the sand. And then the next time that there was an exposure to a slight rejection, a slight um, confrontation, it got a little bit deeper because I learned, oh, see, if I do this, they're going to like me and I'm not going to get rejected. So the line got a little bit deeper. My mom was kind of a yelly kind of person. She was always, she, years later now, she can admit that she was not very nice when I was younger and I forgive her. But um, I wanted her to not yell at me. So if I was good, she wouldn't yell at me. So the line got deeper. And you can see that, that, that neural network, that pathway, um, just the, the connection got stronger and stronger and stronger. And, um, and the saying is in the neuroplasticity world, those, um, those neurons that fire together wire together.
So every time I had another positive engagement with this method, it reinforced, yep, I'm doing this right. And that neural pathway got stronger and stronger and stronger. And then pretty soon I was not even aware of how um, pleasing I was and how I was being. So you can, you can be aware of it. You can know that it's happening. You can be present to, um, yep, I'm a people pleaser. But if you don't actually intentionally do something about it, that's where it can affect your, uh, your business. And so these are just a couple of things that um, how it's going to negatively impact your business when you're on that other spectrum. But under earning is like number one. I mean, when you're not owning your value and you're pleasing and you're eager to close the sale and not own your value, you're going to take less. Um, burnout, because you're going to have no boundaries and overextend yourself and work long hours. Um, overwhelm, again, because you're going to take on things that really you shouldn't, that doesn't fit the mission and vision of your business, that you get like anybody else have um, shiny object syndrome, squirrel. Yeah. It's, it, it is my my addiction. <clears throat> right. Yeah. And how is that serving you? Not well. Mm -hmm. Shiny. I, I'm, I, I'm really oh, okay. So let's say that I decide I want to be a public speaker. Okay. Now I'm going to go study a bunch of public speakers. And I decide I'm going to choose one that I'm going to like study and work with and learn from. But then all of a sudden I get this email one day of this shiny object person. I'm like, oh. I like how they do it. I'm gonna go start learning over here. And then I'm like, oh wait, that one's really good too. Oh wait, that one. So pretty soon I'm trying to like merge all of these people and now I have no direction, no focus. I've, you know, I've done myself a disservice by chasing down all these different rabbit holes and trying to figure out who I am. So, you know, again, that's one of those where you choose your one person that you're gonna follow for that year and you just do it for that year and you focus and that's typically gonna have the best outcome. But yeah, I I showed I joined the Cobos because I was gonna start a canvas making sign, which is actually in, interestingly an element into this. But my point is is that I have I have shiny object syndrome, so that's why I'm so familiar with it. I've never heard of that before. Yeah, squirrel. The better party syndrome. Yes. You have a to go to three parties and you go to this party. Oh, I should have gone to the others. It's always the others must have been there. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's Yeah, been there. And it's hilarious cuz I see my little 11-year-old, I'll say, hey, "Can you go put your clothes away?" And just from here to her room, not far. She gets distracted. She's such a squirrel. She's over here, she's playing with this, she's over there, and then like 2 hours later, I'm like, "Did you do the the what?" So because, you know, you get shiny object syndrome. Uh, it results in lack of motivation because now you're stuck. You know, which party should I go to? I'm just going to stay home now. Um, errors. You're not paying attention. You're not focused. Waste. Poor systems and processes. Frustration. Lack of success. And you're not really meeting your goals or your why. So these are ways that it can impact if you don't, uh, you know, be intentional in trying to figure it out and rewire your brain. And so that's really what, um, and that's really what is possible. So yes, 10, 15 years ago, the concept of rewind your brain was not even like, that was like Columbus days. The world is flat. So neuroscientists felt that if you had, you know, your prime age is before seven, if you had established a neural network of rejection or pleasing, that was not going to change. And what they do know now is that there is neurogenesis. We're regrowing our brain cells every day and we can rewire those pathways. And that's huge and exciting because um, if you have that unwanted and undesirable and you're like, well, kind of that's how I am and I'm trying to be different, there's actually things you can do intentionally to rewire it. Now, it's not easy. It takes work to rewire. And it takes consistency. It's, it's kind of like going to the gym. You don't go to the gym one time and you're fit because that foundation and that line in the sand didn't happen after the, you know, the first experience. It got reinforced, reinforced, reinforced all your life. 
So it really is a journey and a process. And, and I do, um, so my particular uh, coaching practice is women. So um, just pretend today. <laughs> no, I one time had, <laughs> I had, so in nursing, there's so few men. So this one time I had a peer that I was working with and I had, was asking him a question about another, um, a nursing assistant that worked with us. And so I was like, Hey Mark, if you were a guy and he's like, okay, hold on, let me figure this out. <laughs> I was like, Oh gosh, that's terrible. Um, but so I created what I call the um, warrioristic method. So my business is warrioristics. To me, that's living victorious in thinking, um, actions, um, behaviors, and empowering women to you know really own their their value. And so the R three method is designed to just break down your unwanted and undesired fears, guilt, people pleasing behaviors, and and to start rewiring that so you have more confidence in yourself um, and get how awesome you are. Again, this is kind of women focused, but men you could possibly identify. So um, the example here is, did you ever have that pair of pants that you freaking love, but they're too tight, but you wear them anyways? I know, right? How many of you have had that problem? That's why they invented yoga, pants. So my point in this example is that um, that is resistance. You put them on, you wear them because you like them. You're attached to those pants. You're attached to how they look on you. You want to look good. You have a date with your you know, husband that evening or something, but the, the pants are too tight and there's nothing that's going to change that waistband in that moment. And the more you eat, the more you resist that you've got your pants on too tight, um, they're, they're just going to get tighter. It's just going to cause more suffering and pain. Yeah. And then you, um, you know, let that first button go and it's just like, that release. So that's my analogy to what we're doing mentally. We're, when we are resisting something, and we may not even know where we are resisting it, but um, an anxiety comes up for us, and if we don't pay attention to it, we're gonna try to ignore it, we're gonna try to make it go away, we're gonna resist it, and the, it's not gonna go away. So it's really just gonna persist and persist. So you've heard that saying, what you resist will persist. Um, let's say you have to um, call, cold call some customers because you are you need to do something to increase your bottom line. But you're nervous to pick up the phone. And you feel that anxiety um, brewing and that right there is where you're, and you're like, I'll do it later, do it tomorrow, I don't really have anyone to call, I'll work on this over here for a little while. So you're resisting it but it's not gonna go away because your bottom line's still not gonna make a difference if you don't make the calls. Don't they call that procrastination? And procrastination, I think, I think, is a form of resistance and fear of jumping in and tackling it. Does anybody have an example of something that comes up for them that they resist doing at work, with their work, with their business? I resist mopping at home. I've been resisting my creating my email drip campaign for uh, almost a year now. <laughs> okay, why? What's uh, there? For me, it's um, uh, just a, it's a process that I don't want to have to go through because I get to one certain part and it's like, oh my gosh, here I go down the rabbit hole. I have to write this and this and this in order for this to work. And then I have to go mm -hmm. to here, here. So it's overwhelming for me. It's, um, and I'm just like, um, I'll do it later. Mm -hmm. And I and I, I think just my brain can't, um, I can't map it out well. I don't know. So it's just, I'm putting it off. Mm -hmm. And I and I'm probably losing losing um, members because of it. Mm -hmm. So you're procrastinating, it's not going away. Mm -mm. And when you think about it, what comes up for you? <laughs> does that, does, does that, uh. right on. Right on. Um, is there a fear anywhere in there, like the technology or the time or? Yes, there is a technology fear that I, that I won't get it set up right. You're afraid of doing it wrong? Yeah, because, you know, I need certain things to trigger the next 
action. So, you know, I need to like think that through. Okay. Mm -hmm. I need to make sure that this, that this is going to trigger this. If this person's interested in this, Mm -hmm. it's going to trigger this series. If if they're interested in this, it's going to trigger this series. And for some reason, I'm like, I'm going to mess it up. (laughs) I'm going to mess it up. Have you messed up things like that before? Um, with technology wise, yeah, I have. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm recru- uh, That's why I've recruited Josh to help me on Wednesdays. Mm-hmm. So he's helping me get past that. Yeah, it's moving forward. So it's not like this fear of looking bad, or um, well, it could be because if it fails, but mm-hmm. you're you have a a fear of getting it started because you're afraid of not being able to complete it successfully. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, and it's not going away. It's persisting. It's not going away. Yeah. <laughs> It will go away soon. It will, because you're going to give it away? I am. Yeah. (laughs) And that's awesome. That's like step two. Yes. So what do you attach to in that particular scenario? Can you think of something that... That I'm not good enough? Mm -hmm. Is that what you're attached to? Yeah, like, I'm just just not smart enough to get this thing done. I mean, it's been almost a year. Are you kidding, Melanie? Yeah. I was just not good enough to do it. Got it. And I'm like, I don't need, I don't need to be good that good at everything. I just need to find someone who can do it and mm-hmm. can get it done. Now, are you um, not good enough? Is it important to you to be good at technology? Uh, uh, n- <laughs> yes and no, because I I started a business that is more technology than I have ever had in my entire life, and I. I have never desired to be in technology. I come from the world of art and the world of holistic healing, not technology. But I, I, you know, so I've, I've put myself in this unfamiliar world, uh-huh. and um, I have to depend on on other people who are huh. good at this. So how's that depending going? Mm. Yeah, because since I've been a solopreneur my whole life and working alone in my home office all the time, that's hard. Yeah. It's hard for me to let go of control and um, trust that others will get it done. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Were you expected to do um, a lot when you were a child? Were you independent? I was. Yeah. I was independent. Did you ever feel like you weren't good enough? Uh, a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you went into a business that you (laughs) thought was going to be helping people and community and fun, but then you're finding out like a lot of it is going to be reliant on digital and technology (laughs) and you're not really comfortable with it, but you feel like you should be because you own the business. Because I own the business. And, and you're also not, um, you don't easily ask for help or... I'm getting better. Right. I am getting Mm -hmm. better. (laughs) And you're still a little concerned, though, that they're not going to do it as good as you could. No, 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 no. I'm, uh, no. You're not concerned about that? I, I, I know that they can do it better than me. Yeah. You just don't want to depend on them. Um, I don't, a lot of it is I don't want to bother people a lot of times, too. You know, because, because I am so dependent on, um, others to take care of the technology part, um. I don't know. I'm stepping outside of that comfort zone of, of, okay, I'm not by myself anymore. I have to use other people. Because you don't want to bother them. Yeah. Because have you bothered somebody in your past or? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Jay? Yeah. Yeah, I bother him. I bother him a lot. Uh-huh. It's okay. We bother each other. Cause it, can you see how that? Yeah. I can relate to an awful lot of what she said. Yeah. Really? Yes. Yeah. This is so it. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. something I suspect happened at some point in your life where maybe um, it wasn't okay for you to ask for help or bother. I don't know. It's really it, oh, yeah. a discovery for you. It, it was. Mm-hmm. It was, um, you know, when you're a kid and, and you are a very curious kid. Like I was very curious and I had a lot of questions um, I, I wanted help with a lot of things, wanted to understand things, but when I was younger, it was always not now or, you know, shh, be quiet. And, and it was like, 
okay? Am I not, you know, yeah, not really important, not allowed to ask questions? Um, so, yeah. And then I suspect your brain was wanting to protect you. Oh, yeah. And then counterintuitively has said, well, if I don't bother people, then I'm not going to feel rejected like that. Mm-hmm. So I don't have to ask for help. I'll just figure it out myself. Yes. And I did try to figure out. And, and, I, and it had the way that played out in life mm-hmm. for me was I was not going to, you know, in the art world, I was not going to exhibit any of my work until I felt it was not going to be rejected. Ah. It had to be good and like truly good enough mm-hmm. to be out there. Um, so yeah, there was I, pro, I I put off a lot of stuff. Yeah, where even I mean in your relationships, mm-hmm. if you needed help with the difficult situations. You probably didn't want to get help or borrow help or yeah even. Or the way it came off was that I was I, uh, by the time I. I realized I needed the help. Like, it didn't come off nice then. By the time I asked uh-huh. for help, it's like, I need help. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, you're, you're frustrated. Yes, I'm frustrated. Yes, yeah, so it didn't come across well. Yeah. So that's like, what going back a couple of sides, the frustration. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. So it's a big yes. cycle mm-hmm. that gets reinforced and reinforced and reinforced. And the next thing you know, you have, you know a freeway there and that's you don't even know what's happening it's so automatic and subconscious Mm -hmm. so yeah so step one in the in the r3 method is really just identifying what you're resisting but it it takes that probing and getting deeper and deeper and deeper it's not just you're afraid to do email sequence yeah that's just the so the second step then is releasing so like you're attached to looking good in those jeans, you're attached to what you're attached to as far as, um, you know, not asking for help or not wanting to bother people or being able to do it yourself. Um, all of those things, there's usually some attachment to that you're holding on to that, um, that fear. So typically, uh, again, that's going to be diving into what it is and, and, and really a big part of that is ego too. Because our ego doesn't actually want us to, we want us to feel look good. So like um, another aha moment for me was uh, when my, I, would, I had a coach and she would always ac- compliment me on things and I would downplay it. Oh yeah, yeah, I didn't really do that or oh yeah, thank you, but you know, and I would downplay it. See, my ego, see, I really thought that that's the way you should be. So it's kind of weird too, but my ego was saying, well, well, it's almost, it's better socially to not be proud. So I would downplay my uh, talents and skills and accomplishments. And when working with this coach and I discovered that I wasn't actually taking responsibility for being an extraordinary woman. Like it was so simple and aha, and I discovered, oh my gosh, like I'm holding myself back. So how can I make a difference for the world? If I'm being humble, if I'm being small, if I'm being afraid of rejection, you know, I was making it all about me. And I suspect most of you and most human beings are in business of some element to help other people. To, to some degree. It's not, of course, it's the bottom line, but we're all just naturally wired to want to help people. Uh, so you release in your, uh, your ego. So recognizing you're nervous, recognizing you're resisting, and then looking at that ego and seeing what am I holding on to? What am I attached to? Looking good. And even if it's looking good in a counterintuitive, weird kind of way. But you're holding back and you're holding back from what could be possible for yourself or, I mean, for other people. And yeah, that ego, it's all yours. <laughs> like, you can own that one for sure. But, you know, it's come over years. And um, I love this saying, we don't see things as they are. We see things as we are. So if you stop and think about that for a second, if you're being afraid of the email sequence and you're really kind of fixated in that and you're stressed and you're having like that, putting it off, putting it off, putting it off, you're not really um, 
maybe present to the people who are around you that could help or contribute or want to. Because you're just seeing things how you are. But maybe not that, you know, Jay has a secret desire to create email sequence. <laughs> oh my God. Don't you love how I volunteer you for things? Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Teresa paid me. I have talents and skills I'm not aware of. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but really, we, we don't. We don't see when we're stuck, we're fixated on ourselves. When we're on our own little don't reject me, don't reject me, then we're not really seeing what's out there in the world because we're just so in here. So just... Um, you know, that definitely impacts that. And when you can re release your ego, release what you're attached to as far as looking good and all about me and um, don't hurt me and I'm afraid to call people because they're not going to like me or I'm going to look dumb or I don't know what to say. Don't make it about you. Like release that, let it go and make it about them. What can you do for them? What can your business make a difference in their life? All right, so the last part is the rewire your brain and so like be like a cat so we had the dogs right they were eager and jumping up and down and I don't necessarily mean be like a cat because they can actually be kind of pissy but <laughs> if we could uh, slow down take it in not be so um, eager you know they're not really interested in pleasing us Are anybody cat people here yeah so, I mean, at meet the, meet the parents that I just think is, I, I love that movie because with the cat and the, you know, Jinxie. Jinxie. Yes. Jinxie was in control there. Even, even in control of the CIA, dude, you know, like Jinxie had all the power. And that's where with our brains, we can re rewire and re-network that you don't necessarily have to be an egomaniac. I'm, it's again, the continuum, but of, of having power within and owning who you are and what's possible and owning what you can contribute to the world and being a little bit slower uh, like a cat and taking it in. And so I, I shared this, um, this is a similar kind of example, but my daughter is 14, she's discovered boys, she gets in the car every single day, has a new crush on a different boy. Oh, God. I'm like, dude, you shouldn't like tell people this because, you know, I don't want her to be the one that's liking, you know, 90% of the kids at the school. Uh, so we're talking about, she's so eager though. And she's so, you know, she's that dog. And I was like, okay, we're going to practice being like a cat because boys, they don't usually get attracted to the dog that's chasing them all over the playground, but the cat who's ignoring them, doing their own thing, for some reason it works. I know, I'm in a room full of men now, <laughs> teaching you the secret, um, right? I mean, it's, it, it is very, it, I, I think it is more attractive to, if, when, yeah, when you're not like, Although we did have a dog in, in the space today who was rolling over on its back and mm -hmm. and everybody went home <laughs> yeah. to the dog. Yeah. So that yeah. It's not all one hundred percent. But yeah, you can you can rewire your brain, you can pick who you wanna be. I chose a cat, you can choose who you want. So you're anticipating a situation, you're anticipating um, calling, cold calling. I don't know why I keep coming up with that topic. But, um, and you're already nervous, you're already anxious and you're already present to, you're resisting making that call, you're resisting of what you're gonna say, are you gonna look dumb, are they gonna say no, I got rejected when I was two, I don't want them to say no, I'm not gonna call. Well, who do you really wanna be when you're on that phone? Like, that's where you can start with the rewiring of the, the network. Who do you want to be when you pick up that phone? You wanna be powerful, you wanna be slower to speak you want to listen and hear what they have to say you want to um be confident you don't want to give away your your art for 50 percent and it's like thinking that in advance and visioning and planning that out um in in my book i write out you you have a warrior scale and so like if you imagine that um, before you rethink how you want to be, but before you get on the phone or when you're in your state of nervousness, where are you on a scale of zero to 10 of feeling like a warrior? Confident. And, and most people would say, oh, I feel like a two or three because I'm 
chicken right now, who do you want to be? You want to be an eight, you want to be a nine, and then how do you create that? So that starts to lay that foundation of, of rewiring your um, network. Uh, so, but what science has really found, it's, it is that, it takes practice, it takes a lot of time, but the most compelling that they've been able to actually prove with imaging is if you do on a routine basis something that is extremely captivating to you, or not, it could be just something you're afraid of doing, and then you've ground that in uh, powerful emotions, powerful thoughts of yourself, who you want to be on that scale of one to 10. And you can do these in five minutes a day. So I gave you some pretty profound, you know, like if you're jumping off a cliff, you're so focused right now. And the idea is our brain spends a lot of time in default mode. Did I close the garage door? Uh, did I lock the door before I went to bed? Did I turn the alarm on? We forget because we're in such a default la la mode in our own head and we're not really paying attention. But the more time you can spend on a daily basis in a focused mode where you're totally present. Like right now, I'm so present with you guys. I have no idea what's going on outside the world because I'm very focused and I'm, this is a brain vacation for me because we actually have like 70,000 thoughts per, per day in our head which is total chaos. Men, I've heard is a little bit less. I don't mean that in a, in a negative way, but women just freaking. Well, yeah, women ha have trouble shutting it off yeah. at, at night. Right. I would rather not have that. I, I heard a good way to refer, there was a terrific book I read called Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. Susan Jeffries. Mm -hmm. And she refers to those con that constant stream of thoughts as the chatterbox. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And it puts sort of a, a comedic aspect to it. So, okay, that's just my chatterbox. Go away. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's all it is. Yeah. But I'm curious as to, regarding your example of cold calling, yep. what captivating, let's say that's something that you needed to do. Yep. Your business depended on it. Mm -hmm. So how would you apply that top sentence to... Uh, becoming better at cold calling. Okay, so the idea here is to to be present here and now, to recognize that cold calling is is frightening to you, to say, okay, how do I want to be? This is where I am. I'm like at a two or a three. I want to be at a 10. It's being totally present with it in the process. And in that case, it is fearful. It is being afraid, which is captive, which if you intentionally think about it, Picking up that phone, you're probably not thinking about all of your to-do list because you're so focused on the fear of, so it's, it's just a practice, 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 the focused practice. focused activity would be to make, go ahead and make the calls because yep. action, I think, is very important in rewiring. Yes. yes. So. Now, these are other things that you can do outside of the actual, uh, that exercise. So for example, let's say you have a big, huge presentation that's coming up. Um, the whole point is to increase the amount of time you spend in a focus mode so that you're present. And while you're in that focus mode, taking on, I am powerful. I am able to make this call. I am going to be like a cat. I am going to slow down my speaking, my thought process. And I am going to, so you do it over and over and over so that in time it becomes automatic because your automatic reaction is nervous, scared, afraid. But by rewiring that, um, and then, you know, it's, it's that constant repetition of practice to sustain it. These were, um, in a general sense, if you're somebody who has a general sense of, of, um, insecurities, uh, lack of confidence, lack of self-esteem, then uh, it's, it's very powerful. So I didn't, this is an example of, of, of neuroplasticity in my own brain. A girlfriend invited me to go to one of those canvas and wine places. I hadn't paid it since I was like in kindergarten. I was like, ah, you know, whatever, there's wine, <laughs> I'll go. <laughs> so I went and I was like, oh my, I had such an amazing experience and it had nothing to do with the wine. It was because I was so focused on making this little it was ugly. My husband wouldn't let me bring it in the house. <laughs> However, when I left that night, I was so happy. I didn't know then what neuroplasticity was. 
I now know why. It was because my brain was on like a little vacation. I wasn't thinking about anything else for a while. And then I was creating, you know, an ugly piece of art. Over time though, I, I don't care. I love that art. I actually don't know where it is. We've moved a few times since then. Uh, but I have that memory and I cherish that memory and I know that that's good for me. So the more things you do for yourself, good for yourself, will you feel that freedom? Um, there was a program I did, I guess I worked at Mayo, I had the opportunity to go study with um, an integrative medicine physician, Dr. Amit Sud. He wrote the book, The Mayo Clinic Guide to Stress-Free Living. And he also wrote the happiness handbook. So I got to study with him for six months. He was amazing. Um, when he would have like, he would, his, his interventions would be like Monday would be compassion day. Tuesday would be, um, um, gratitude day. Wednesday would be another day. And then he would have different interventions where you would take a moment and it, you bring in your senses and you, um, like you feel the table and you can feel the coldness underneath your hand and how it's flat and it's smooth and you're really focused. I mean, it takes that long for you to get focused and then be like, okay, I'm getting ready to go into a big meeting. Who am I? Who am I going to be? What's going to happen? How am I going to act? So you can do things like that. Um, you can go outside if you're having that anxiety moment and look at a flower and just stare at it and see how many little um, stems come out and what's the shape of them and how is that unique to the one next to it. Again, it's a focused activity. Bringing you back to grounding and then... Um, taking a little mini brain vacation. And then, okay, I'm gonna go into um, work today and I'm a new manager. So to the end story of my thing, aside from having my passions that I love outside of work, I have um, just recently taken a position over at the hospital, YRMC West, and I'm the manager for the ICU, the CVICU, and the PCU. Wow. 20 years ago, when I was a manager, I was a freaking kiss butt person. Like I was so eager to please. And I thought I was there. Uh, the reason I was there was a different reason. When I go to work now, even the first day I was like, I am not the same person I was before because I've been doing this for so long and working on the neuroplasticity that when I walked in and I'm in a, you don't usually hire a nurse manager from the outside to come in. It's pretty unusual. They usually work their way up, but who I was for them was who I wanted to be 20 years ago, but didn't know it. And so I, I feel like I've been there forever. It's been two months. I love my job. I love the people that I get to be. And I know my mission in that role is to empower them to be the best they can be so that those patients get the best care that they could ever get. And so if those nurses believe in themselves, they're going to give that and the patients are going to know that. So I am going to be doing some um, brain boot camps because uh, it doesn't happen every day. It's something that you have to practice. And a lot of times it's helpful if you have guidance. And Melanie and I are kind of teasing out the details of that. But I would love to do that here just to help people to start pick up some practices that they can do on their own. Um, <coughs> meditation is hard. That's a pretty uh, familiar one that people suggest doing for neuroplasticity. But to get into that quiet, steady state is extremely difficult. And so that's why Dr. Amit said he, he comes up with like everyday kinds of things, like looking at the colors of this and taking a few minutes and looking at the green versus the white versus the green. And I wonder why they put that there. And oh, it's not 2018 anymore, it's 2019. But you can do things real life at the time to help chill and bring it down. And then say, okay, I gotta pick up the phone now, I'm gonna call. And I'm not gonna be a dog, I'm gonna be a cat. And I'm gonna not speak first. And I'm going to put it out there and I'm going to own who I am. Nice. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah. Um, what kind of a process do you use in your approach, like initially meeting with somebody? and uh, With coaching? Yeah, regarding your... Um, coaching well I mean that's a that's like that's kind of what this is is, is testing so um, so far what my process has been was um, within my it was it's kind of been my warm network like I'm working with a, a nurse practitioner who her people pleasing is she's a primary care nurse practitioner um, she did some surveys for me so that was kind of the 
introduction, the engagement. So I created a survey, not so different from that one, but a little bit, and then um, was able to ask people, would you consider? And then from that, would you be open to a conversation? And then with that, then I had a conversation with her about the counterintuitive part of the brain. The really cool thing is she was a, um, a nurse practitioner in a, a neurology clinic. So I was a little intimidated to have this conversation with somebody who studies neurology. And she was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. This is so cool. And so for her, her people pleasing is that, you know, when you go to the doctor and you are there for an appointment that you think you only need, they think you're coming in for one or two things, but then you actually come in with like five. Yeah. So consider this, the doctor's office is a little bit like a hair salon. If you come in for a cut, they have this much time. But if you come in for a cut and color, you got this much time. People don't understand that. So they would come in for a cut, but they really needed a color. <laughs> so they have their list of stuff. And she, being the pleaser, didn't want to cut them off and say, hey, abs actually, I can only help you with two things today. We'll have to make an appointment for the next one. So she was very dissatisfied at work because she was um, burnt out, working on weekends, finishing charting, dissatisfied because she was afraid to just say to them, hey, I got 10 minutes. Number one and number two, let's go. She didn't even know that was a possibility. And so we kind of created that with her and she's, yeah. Anita, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.